All right, welcome back. We've got another episode of Rad Path Rounds. I'm so excited. I am Ryan Appleby, a veterinary radiologist. And I'm Kate Baker, a veterinary clinical pathologist. Kate, it is great to see you. How are things? Oh, it's great. I'm just, you know, here teaching people stuff with you. It's, I mean, it couldn't be better. <laughs> Could not be better. Uh, we love what we do both on the ra- radiology and cytology sli- sides. Oh, slides. 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 Hey, I like that. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we love what we do both in radiology and cytology, and uh, we want to share that with you. And we've got some really interesting cases where we can correlate what's going on on imaging and on cytology. And so um, let's get into today's case. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So the signalment and history for today's case is a seven-year-old female spade mastiff who has a progressive left pelvic limb lameness. So Whenever we're faced with a patient with a lameness, the most important thing to do is use our physical exam to localize where that lameness is coming from. The reason being is that collimated radiographs to our region of interest are going to do us so much better than having just, you know, blasting the whole patient, looking for what might be wrong across the patient. So we really need to take collimated radiographs to that region of interest. It's almost like, you know, when you, you, turn that microscope up to the higher power, you're focusing in on that area, you are seeing what you need to see instead of just looking at the whole limb. So in this case, you know, the clinicians did a wonderful job focusing into the area where they found pain on their orthopedic exam. So this patient had swelling and pain at the level of the distal tibia of the left pelvic limb. And so these are the radiographs that were acquired. They're nicely collimated. We've got a craniocaudal projection on the left-hand side of our screen and a straight lateral projection on the right-hand side of our screen. And so what are we seeing? What are we looking at? Well, the first thing that jumps out at me, of course, is this new bone proliferation. So along the medial aspect of the distal tibia, right along here, we've got new bone proliferation which corresponds with bone proliferation, both at the caudal aspect of the tibia and the cranial margin of the tibia here. So this is a lot of new bone that is being produced. The question that I have whenever I see a periosteal reaction like this is, is that periosteal reaction smooth or is it irregular? And in this instance, we would call this an irregular periosteal reaction, especially when we look here on this lateral projection, the irregular margin. So this kind of like undulating, almost spiculated appearance to this cranial aspect. Uh, this is, you know, super, super irregular along both the cranial and caudal aspects. And similarly, along this medial aspect, we've got an irregular periosteal reaction. So that's finding number one. Irregular periosteal reactions are an indication of an aggressive bone lesion. So whenever we see an irregular periosteal reaction or any periosteal reaction, we need to look for some of those other pieces of evidence for aggressive bone lesions. And so the other thing that I'm gonna be looking for here is bone loss, regions of lysis. I think I see that best in this lateral projection where at the caudal aspect of this tibia, there's a region of relative lucency. So if you compare the opacity of the bone right here to the opacity of the bone, you know, more proximally in this bone, uh, there's definitely some bone loss in that region. And similarly here in the craniocaudal projection, we have regions of stipple lucency throughout the distal metaphysis compared to the more proximal portion or this distal diaphysis of the bone here. So I've got lots of evidence pointing me towards an aggressive osseous lesion. And then of course, I also have radiographic evidence of soft tissue swelling. There's increased soft tissues right along the margin of this bone here. So putting all of these pieces together, We've got a mixed osteolytic, so bone loss, bone lysis, and osteoproliferative, that's that periosteal reaction, mixed osteolytic and osteoproliferative lesions. Our differential diagnoses for this, number one is generally speaking going to be osteosarcoma. We could also have fungal osteomyelitis, and we could have an other, uh, another neoplasm uh, as a cause. But the location is super, super important. So osteosarcoma is the most common primary bone tumor of dogs. We like to say that these occur away from the elbow and towards the knee plus the distal tibia. 
So in this case, we've got distal tibia. That is a very common location for an osteosarcoma. So it, to me, is an osteosarc until proven otherwise. And how are we going to prove it? Well, that's where Dr. Baker comes in. So I would put a needle into this lesion. Typically myself, I do it through ultrasound guidance, but you could do this as a, uh, a blind fine needle aspirate as well, palpating the lesion. And then of course you wanna send it to your favorite cytologist, uh, Dr. Kate Baker, and see what she has to say. So Kate, what did we find? All right, so let's take a look at the cytology sample now. All right, so here we are looking at this cytology sample from this bone aspirate. And the first thing to think about here is that this is really cellular, which I always say we really like as cytologists because we want cells to look at, but bone should not exfoliate normally very well. If you stick a needle into a normal bone, it's really not gonna give you many cells. What you might see there are normal bone elements like normal low numbers of osteoblasts, maybe an osteoclast, but really it shouldn't be highly cellular. So already off the bat, this is very abnormal that we can see all of these cells here on this slide. And it's a little bit difficult to see them you know, in detail here at this lower objective view. So we're gonna get closer, but I really wanted to drive home just how cellular this is. We also in cytology like to look at multiple objectives because, and just like Dr. Appleby had said, it's, we want to start a little bit farther back, but we really then want to hone in on what we're really focusing on and we can get more detail there. But we do want to take a look at this lower objective because we want to see how the cells are interacting with each other. And that will help us be able to differentiate whether a neoplastic population in particular is epithelial, mesenchymal, or round cell in origin. And that helps us organize what type of tumor we might be dealing with. So already I can see these cells don't look normal. This is really highly cellular. This is very, very likely going to be a neoplastic population. So we're gonna get closer and look at them in more detail. So here's just a little group of cells here that are, again, we wanna ignore this green stained blood in the background. What we're looking at are these nucleated cells that are surrounded by this kind of pink material. And that's gonna be important here in just a second. So first let's look at the cells themselves. Do we think they're epithelial, mesenchymal, or round cell in origin? Now, I know some of them have a little bit of a rounded type appearance, but they're not round cell in origin. A lot of them actually have some projections off of the sides and have a little bit of a wispy look to them. And so um, also, if we're thinking, oh, this might be a round cell tumor, we have to think about the five round cell tumors, recognize that this doesn't look like any of those, so we can eliminate that. They also don't look epithelial because epithelial cells like to stick together and these cells are, are close to each other, but they're not stuck together intentionally. So this is a mesenchymal population. And then we have to think, okay, do we see criteria of malignancy to support that this is a sarcoma, which is a malignant mesenchymal tumor? And so we're gonna look at that. I'm gonna come back to this picture in just a second to talk about that pink material. But I think this photo really shows the criteria of malignancy very well. Again, we can see the shape of these cells supporting mesenchymal origin, which we've already discussed, but then we're looking for criteria of malignancy. And those are things like anisocytosis, which means different size cells. And we can see that here, we've got cells that are a little bit smaller. I mean, they're all pretty big, <laughs> but there's a variety of sizes and that's not a good thing. We also have anisocaryosis, which is different size nuclei. So some nuclei are a little bit smaller than, and some are bigger. We also have binucleation. Here's a cell that has two nuclei. That's not normal. We also have prominent nucleoli, these big prominent nucleoli in these cells. That's another criteria for malignancy. So we've got multiple criteria of malignancy here. We, we like to see at least three when we're trying to decide if we're dealing with a malignant population. And we certainly have at least three in this population. So this is consistent with a sarcoma. And so then we have to say, is there anything that can help us decide if we think it's more likely to be a certain type of sarcoma versus another type. Sometimes we need histopathology or special stains to make that final call for us, but sometimes in the population, we can get some clues on cytology that help us lead one way or another. Because right now we have a diagnosis of sarcoma, but you know, are we dealing with an osteosarcoma? Are we dealing with a fibrosarcoma or hemangiosarcoma or histiocytic sarcoma? These are all different types of sarcoma that can occur in bone. Um, the thing about this population that makes me very concerned, um, you know, very, very suspicious for osteosarcoma in particular, there's a couple of clues here. 
One is that if you look at these cells again, they kind of have a plasma cytoid look to them. They almost look a little bit like plasma cells. Like if you look at them, um, you notice that they're nuclear off to the side, which is kind of a plasma cellish type um, appearance. And uh, some of them, and they're probably better in this picture. So it's a little bit hard to see, but you can sometimes see like a clear, like a little bit of a clear space next to the nucleus. Osteoblasts, so normally, look like plasma cells. It's kind of a weird thing. So when they become neoplastic, they can still maintain some of those plasma cytoid features. They're not actually plasma cells. They just have similar appearances on cytology. So the fact that this population has that kind of plasma cytoid look really puts osteosarcoma even further up on my list in combination with the fact that, as already discussed, it's the most common tumor type. So it's very likely that this is an osteosarcoma. Also, osteosarcomas like to make osteoid. So we, when we see this pink material, that really suggests that this is osteoid. So all of the signs are pointing here to osteosarcoma. We've got a markedly atypical mesenchymal population with those subtle plasma cytoid features. We can make a competent diagnosis of sarcoma on cytology, and then we can say we strongly suspect this is osteosarcoma. The reason I don't say 100% is just because there are some overlapping features cytologically between different sarcoma types. So we really want to get histopath to confirm that, or there's some special stains you can perform as well. Well, that's super cool. I mean, yeah. I always love looking at those cyto images. I think, well, especially because I get to see something in color for once in a while. <laughs> But uh, I mean, you know, seeing those features that are helping you differentiate between, you know, any kind of other type of tumor or really focusing in to make it the osteosarcoma instead of just sarcoma. Those are uh, great little tricks of the trade um, and looking for that osteoid, that little pink hazy matrix. That's really neat. I've never actually, I've always seen that on the cytology reports. There's evidence of osteoid, but I didn't know what it looked like. So that's great. Yeah, Thank there you, you go. That. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so, you know, uh, Osteosarcoma is a malignant neoplasm of osteoblasts. Most are skeletal, but uh, some can be extra, extra skeletal. So you can have them in other locations, say for instance, in the abdomen, maybe in association with the spleen. Uh, and then treatment for osteosarcoma, the mainstay of treatment in most of these animals are gonna get amputation and chemotherapy. And these patients are gonna have a median survival time of about 10 to 12 months. But there are other options, you know, dogs do quite well on three legs, but if it's not an option, maybe there's other orthopedic disease or uh, other limiting factors that is maybe just not the right choice for that dog or that family. Uh, palliative radiation is another option that can be offered. It provides about 60 to 70% pain control for four to five months. And then there's palliative medications, which give a median survival time of about one to three months. And, you know, if you're interested in learning more about osteosarcoma specifically, Dr. Chris Bernard on our site, obivet.com, has a wonderful course that includes uh, osteosarcoma, talks about it in uh, his course, his Foundations of Oncology course. So go ahead and check that out, obivet.com slash courses slash oncology. And uh, this has been a lot of fun, Dr. Baker. How did, how did you feel about this case? Oh, I loved it. Again, it's just so great to be able to see the correlation between the imaging and the cytology. And I loved seeing, you know, I remember back to school and I remember some of the things you were talking about, but it's been a while since I've seen the actual imaging of, of these, of these cases. I just see the cytology. So I hope everybody here learned a lot from being able to see those correlates. Yeah, me too. Uh, I mean, I'm having a lot of fun doing this. I think yeah. we're going to do it again. And uh, I hope everybody watching will come back and join us for our, our next case. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye.